The Bermuda Triangle to some is going to terrify them, but to others it's seen as a very casual stretch of water where the average amount of ships tend to sink in a highly traveled shipping lane. And to that degree, the latter over the former is technically correct, but as you dive deeper into the history of the missing vessels, you kind of begin to see an emerging pattern that would make it appear as though it's more than just a danger to passing ships, but to any craft in the immediate area. As it's not just ships that tend to sink there, it is also known as the Devil's Triangle, and what else is known is that it will see its fair share of planes go down as well. Planes that during their last transmission would break contact and continue to fly for hours despite people trying to contact them. Disoriented, they would then call back after just picking a direction based on some islands that they saw. They still knew where the sun was setting and rising, meaning that they should have been able to navigate even without their equipment, but they would never return, highlighting just how strange this section of water can be. Flight 19 was comprised of a formation of five General Motors TBM Avenger torpedo bombers that vanished into the depths of the Bermuda Triangle on December 5, 1945. This disappearance unfolded during a United States Navy overwater navigation training flight originating from the Naval Air Force Station, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Horrifically, all 14 men aboard the aircraft were lost in this incident. The mystery will only continue to deepen from here as Martin PBM Mariner Flying Boat was dispatched from the Naval Air Force Station, Banana River, to locate Flight 19, and they would disappear with all 13 crew members on board seemingly have been lost forever. The narrative that would emerge from the Navy investigators would shed light on the strange set of events that led to this absolutely bizarre loss that even to this day confuses people as to how this actually went down. Flight leader Lieutenant Charles C. Taylor would play a pivotal role in this unfolding drama as they were flying on that fateful day. Strange readings from the craft began to emerge that would absolutely affect the events that were to come later on. It was also revealed that Taylor's compasses malfunctioned during the flight leaving him confused as to which way he was headed, which way he should turn, and how he was supposed to get back to land. Tragically, this disorientation led Taylor to mistake small islands as mentioned off the coast of Florida and prompted Flight 19 to head over an open expanse of sea further and further away from their destination. So in today's episode, let's discuss the strange disappearance of these men in the same section of waters many ships have gone down and further cover the tragic fate of the men sent to rescue them as no survivors would ever be coming back. Flight 19 embarked on what initially seemed like a very routine navigation and combat training exercise operating the TBM type aircraft. This particular assignment was dubbed the Navigation Problem Number 1, a mission that entailed a fusion of bombing and navigation tasks, much like others that were scheduled for that day. The leader of the flight was United States Navy Lieutenant Charles Carroll Taylor, an experienced aviator who had approximately about 2,500 hours of flying under his belt, predominantly in an aircraft of this same type. His trainee pilots, on the other hand, had accrued a total of around 300 hours in the air, including 60 hours of flight in the Avenger. Taylor's own flying history included a combat tour in the Pacific Theater as a torpedo bomber on the aircraft carrier USS Hancock, coupled with his recent tenure as a VTP or torpedo bombing plane instructor at NAS Miami. The student pilots were U.S. Marine Captain Edwards Joseph Prowers and George William Stevers, U.S. Marine Second Lieutenant Forrest James Gerber, and USN Ensign Joseph Tipton Bossy. And did I pronounce that name right? Probably not, I'm sure somebody will tell me in the comments. The flight consisted of five aircraft, specifically three TBM-1Cs, a single TBM-1E, and a lone TBM-3. These aircraft were variations of the Grumman TBF Avenger, manufactured under the wartime production license by General Motors Eastern Aircraft Division. During World War II, aircraft built by the Grumman were designated as TBF, while General Motors produced models like these were marked as TBM in the U.S. Navy aircraft designation system. Each aircraft was meticulously fueled, but during pre-flight checks, it was discovered that all the clocks were inexplicably missing. Which, I mean, probably should raise some red flags, right? But this absence of timekeeping equipment initially raised no alarms, as it was assumed that each pilot possessed their own wristwatch. Small events such as these that seemingly would cause no issue may have been what led to the cascading problems witnessed later. The scheduled takeoff time was around 13.45 local time, or in regular time, 1.45. Yet Taylor's tardiness led to a delay pushing the departure time to 14.10 or 2.10. Meteorological conditions at NNAS Fort Lauderdale were described as favorable with sea state characterized as 
kind of moderate to rough. Taylor assumed a supervisory role for the mission, allowing for a trainee pilot to take up the position of lead at the front of the formation. The training exercise was structured in three legs, with the flight having successfully completed four legs, the fourth involving a return, to NAS Fort Lauderdale after reaching the Florida coast. Following takeoff, the squadron maintained a heading of 91 degrees, almost due east, for a distance of 56 nautical miles, arriving at Hens and Chickens Shoals, colloquially referred to as Chicken Rocks. It was here that they engaged in a low-level bombing practice. The journey was set to continue along the same bearing for an additional 67 nautical miles before pivoting to a course of 346 degrees, covering a distance of 73 nautical miles. This portion of the route involved flying over Grand Bahama Island. The upcoming schedule turn was a heading of 241 degrees, entailing a flight span of around 120 nautical miles. At the conclusion of this stage, the exercise would conclude, and the Avengers were to execute a left turn initiating a return to NAS Fort Lauderdale. Radio communications between the pilots were intercepted by the base and other aircraft operating in the vicinity, offering a window into the unfolding events. Evidence points to the completion of the practice bombing exercise as indicated by the pilot's request and subsequent authorization to release their final bomb at around 1500 or 3 p.m. Around 40 minutes later, Lieutenant Robert F. Cox, who was preparing to lead a group of students for the same mission in FT-74, received a rather odd transmission. The ensuing exchange started to bring into focus that something might be wrong. An unidentified crew member sought compass readings from Powers, one of his students. Powers' response hinted at disorientation. He was quoted as saying, I don't know where we are. We must have gotten lost after that last turn. Cox interjected, transmitting an appeal. This is FT-74, plane or boat calling Powers. Please identify yourself so someone can assist you. After a brief pause, a request for suggestions emerged from the flight's ranks. FT-74 again attempted, and a voice identified as FT-28 belonging to Taylor responded, FT-28, this is FT-74, what is your trouble? Cox inquired. Taylor's reply revealed a dire predicament. Both of my compasses are out, and I'm trying to locate Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I am overland, but it's broken. I am sure I'm in the Keys, but I don't know my precise location or how to navigate to Fort Lauderdale. Taking charge of the situation, FT-74 relayed to the Naval Air Force Station that the aircraft were lost and subsequently advised Taylor to position the sun on his port wing and fly northward along the coast to reach Fort Lauderdale. The base was queried whether Taylor's aircraft was equipped with a standard YG, which is an identification tag for friend or foe, transmitter, which would be utilized to triangulate the flight's position. However, FT-28 did not acknowledge this message, and subsequently at 16.45 or 4.45 p.m., FT-28 radioed outlining their intended course. We are heading 30 degrees for 45 minutes, after which we will alter our course northward to ensure that we are not above the Gulf of Mexico. This interval marked a period of radio silence with no bearings or IFF signals detected. In an attempt to re-establish communication, Taylor was directed to transmit onto a frequency of 4805 kHz. At this point though, again, there was no response to this directive, prompting a request for a switch to 3000 kHz, the designated search and rescue frequency. Taylor's response emphasized his need to preserve the integrity of the aircraft. I cannot switch frequencies. I must maintain the integrity of my planes. This would seemingly mean that he didn't want to switch frequencies because then he would lose basically communication with all of the other pilots around him who had much less experience than him. However, why not tell them to also switch to that frequency that is search and rescue? At around 16.56 or 4.56 p.m., Taylor was once more urged to activate his YG transmitter if available, though he did not acknowledge this plea. This would indicate that either he did not hear it because he was out of range or potentially something could have been blocking the actual signal. Shortly thereafter, he advised his flight to change course to 90 degrees due east for 10 minutes. Around this time, a member of the flight expressed frustration with this order, exclaiming, damn it, if we could just fly west, we could get home head west. This difference of opinion later raised queries regarding why the students did not just opt to head west independently. Explanation would then emerge, attributing their actions to military discipline, basically saying that there is a significance to adhering to established protocols, and to be honest with you, there is a certain amount of human psychology associated with this, which basically states, uh, you're gonna go with the group, and if like most of the group wants to stay 
with the guy that might be kind of bring you in the wrong direction, you might stay. In fact, actually, I mean, this was seen with the Colorado Cannibal. Despite him not knowing where he was going, a lot of people still followed him even after he proved he had no idea where he was going because people wanted to follow him. It's, it's actually kind of a psychological flaw in humans. As atmospheric conditions progressively worsened, the clarity of radio communication began to fluctuate, raising concerns that the five aircraft had ventured more than 200 nautical miles or 230 miles, you know, in normal terms, or about 370 kilometers, into the expanses of the sea east of the Florida Peninsula. At this juncture, Taylor transmitted a course of action. We'll proceed 270 degrees westward until we encounter land or exhaust our fuel supply. Furthermore, at 1524 or 524 p.m., he sought an update on the prevailing weather conditions. After gathering information from multiple sources, this led to the triangulation of Flight 19's location by about 1750 or 550 p.m., estimating their position within a radius of 100 nautical miles or 120 miles, about 190 kilometers, centered at 29 degrees north, 79 degrees west. This placed Flight 19 north of the Bahamas and significantly distant from the central Florida coastline. These events continued till about 1804 or 6.04 p.m. when Taylor relayed to his flight, maintaining 270, we miscalculated our eastward progress, it seems prudent to retrace our path eastward once again. By this point, weather conditions had further deteriorated and the sun had set, enveloping the environment in darkness. Around 1820 or 620 p.m., Taylor's final message would be received. Alternate accounts also indicate that Taylor's last message actually arrived at 1904, which is 704 p.m. In his transmission, he conveyed a sense of urgency, instructing all aircraft maintain close formation. We may be compelled to execute a water landing unless land is spotted. When the first plane's fuel gauge drops below 10 gallons, or about 38 liters, we shall all descend together. As the stark reality of the flight's lost status unfolded, air bases, aircraft, and merchant ships were promptly alerted to the situation. With a clear sense of urgency, a consolidated PBY Catalina embarked on a mission of search and rescue, departing shortly after 1800 or 6 p.m. in pursuit of Flight 19, hopeful of guiding them back to safety should their location be ascertained. The veil of darkness descended, prompting a strategic diversion of two Martin PBM Mariner flying boats from their intended training flights. These aircraft were rerouted to conduct comprehensive square pattern searches within the vicinity of 29 degrees north and 79 degrees west. Among these, U.S. Navy Squadron Training No. 49 PBM-5 took off from the Naval Air Force Station Banana River, now Patrick Space Force Base, at 1927 or 727 p.m. The aircraft transmitted a routine radio message at 1930, which is 7.30 p.m., yet thereafter, communication was tragically severed and its presence faded into the void. By 2115 or 915, the USS Gaines Mills, a tanker traversing the region, reported a grim observation that would send shockwaves to the ongoing search efforts. The vessel reported witnessing flames erupting in a towering explosion ascending to a height of 100 feet, around 30 meters, and persisting for a duration of 10 minutes. This fiery event was pinpointed at coordinates 28.59 degrees north, and 80.25 degrees west. Captain Shona Stanley, overseeing the tanker, recounted the agonizing endeavor to locate survivors amidst a patch of oil and aviation gasoline. Amidst the unfolding tragedy here, the escort carrier USS Solomons also communicated a loss of radar contact with an aircraft aligning in both position and timing with the aforementioned incident. Essentially, everybody that was trying to find everything was having issues locating anything. Several months following the terrible incident, the Navy Board of Investigations released a comprehensive 500-page report offering a series of significant observations. The first was that Flight Leader Lieutenant Charles C. Taylor had been under the erroneous impression that a small group of islands he traversed were the Florida Keys, and also that his flight was traversing the Gulf of Mexico, and that by proceeding northeast, they would inevitably reach Florida. This investigation clarified that Taylor had indeed crossed over the Bahamas adhering to their planned route and had led his flight northeastward over the expanse of the Atlantic Ocean. Interestingly, the report pointed out that certain subordinate officers seemingly possessed an approximate sense of their location, as inferred from radio transmissions, indicating that flying west would lead them to mainland. Notably, Taylor's refusal to alter the radio training frequency to the designated search and rescue radio frequency was highlighted in the report. This was due to the interference posed by Cuban radio stations and an underlying radio carrier wave. The malfunctioning compasses were deemed responsible for Taylor's plight, exonerating him from any fault. Although, I mean, again, 
Some of the trainees knew that they should fly west, but he kept wanting to fly east. And it was probably because they were undertrained that they continued to go along with this and the sense of going with the group rather than flying out alone. The loss of PBM-5 was attributed to an explosion that just randomly happened on this plane that nobody really knows why, but it's just a tragic event marked by an additional layer of what the hell is happening. But besides this comprehensive report, it kind of underwent modification over time, with the Navy altering its conclusion to case unknown, following Taylor's mother's assertion that the Navy was unjustly placing blame on her son for the loss of both five aircraft and 14 lives, despite the lack of evidence in terms of bodies or airplanes. Had Flight 19 been in the exact location Taylor assumed, they could have potentially reached the Florida coastline within 20 minutes, contingent on their vertical positioning. Nevertheless, a later reconstruction of the incident illuminated a different reality. The islands Taylor perceived were likely the Bahamas, situated well northeast of the Keys. This analysis showed that Flight 19 was in precisely the expected location. The Board of Investigation uncovered a crucial aspect, though. Taylor's unwavering belief in being on a direct course to Florida actually propelled the flight further to the northeast and out to sea. Moreover, NAS Fort Lauderdale personnel shared the knowledge that if a pilot became lost at sea in this area, flying due west at 270 degrees, this was a dependable recourse. Another unwritten guideline suggested that if a pilot got disoriented flying south, they should turn their plane around with the sun on the left side and follow the Florida coast northward. By the time Flight 19 eventually turned west, it is conceivable that they had traversed a considerable distance from shore. Essentially, they were running on fumes at this point and it wasn't looking good as they had pretty much surpassed their aircraft's ability to conserve fuel. And along with this, the weather conditions and the Avengers water landing tendencies and the dwindling fuel all exacerbated the dire situation, rendering rescue increasingly improbable, even if they managed to stay afloat. A potential scenario then presented itself wherein Taylor might have inadvertently overshot Gorda Kay and instead reached another landmass within the southern Abaco Islands. Subsequently, he continued northwest as per the planned route. Taylor was anticipating the site of Grand Bahama Island ahead and in line with the expectations. Instead, what he identified as Grand Bahama Islands to his right was in reality the northern section of Abaco Island. Misinterpreting his compass malfunction as responsible for his deviation, he then set a southwestward course intending to fly to Fort Lauderdale. However, this course alteration veered him further to the northwest, eventually leading him to fly out into open ocean. To further confound this situation, Taylor encountered a succession of islands situated north of Abaco, bearing a striking resemblance to the Key West Islands. At this juncture, the control tower intervened, advising Taylor's team to veer westward a course that would eventually lead them to the Florida mainland. With this counsel in mind, Taylor oriented towards what he believed was a westerly direction, yet in reality, he was steering to the northwest, a trajectory nearly parallel to Florida. Having adhered to this approach for a period without seeing land, Taylor eventually reached a pivotal conclusion. The prospect of traversing such a considerable distance westward without encountering Florida seemed implausible. Which I would have to agree. I mean, if you, you're flying straight, but you're not flying west enough, eventually you're going to start to freak out because you haven't seen land yet. He entertained the notion that he might be actually in proximity to Key West Islands, thus prompting a sequence of earnest deliberations amongst Taylor and his fellow crew members and the control tower. Taylor's uncertainty prevailed, marked by his inability to ascertain whether their location aligned with the Bahamas or Key West. This uncertainty was compounded by a compass malfunction, further eroding their ability to gauge direction. In response, the control tower imparted that Key West was improbable given the prevailing wind patterns. A significant portion of the aircrew maintained faith in the functionality of their compasses, though. In response, Taylor initiated a course northeast guided by the compass readings, a trajectory that would supposedly lead them to Florida if they were indeed near Key West. When this endeavor yielded no success, Taylor adjusted the course to due west according to the compass in an attempt to align with reaching Florida that they had been situated within the Bahamas. Had Taylor adhered to this path, he would have likely have guided them to land before their fuel was depleted. However, Taylor's conviction wavered and he eventually decided that his attempts at heading west had reached their limit. Consequently, he reverted to a course northeast, believing that Key West was their approximate location. As the fuel reserves dwindled, Taylor's flight was left with no alternative. Their journey culminated with the exhaustion of fuel, culminating 
and the possibility of a crash into the ocean, potentially positioned north of Abaco Island to the east of Florida. In 1986, during the search of the wreckage of the Space Shuttle Challenger, a discovery was made off the Florida coast. An Avenger's wreckage was located. Aviation archaeologist John Meyer took on the task of retrieving this wreckage from the ocean floor in 1990. However, he mistakenly assumed that his findings corresponded to one of the missing planes. A subsequent event then unfolded in 1991 when a treasure hunting expedition led by Graham Hawks announced the discovery of wreckage from five Avengers off Florida's coast. Subsequent investigation of their tail numbers, however, revealed that these planes were not Flight 19. Apparently, I, I don't know, man, Avengers are just going down over the coast of Florida. I mean, you know, it is kind of one of those deals where there is a actual base there, but it's interesting how many of these are actually just falling out of the sky. A BBC documentary in 2004 showcased Hawks returning with a new submersible after 12 years aiming to identify one of the planes using its bureau numbers, readable as 23990. It was identified as a flight lost at sea on October 9th, 1943, over two years before Flight 19 with its crew surviving. Yet definitively, identifying the other planes proved elusive. The documentary concluded that these incidences seem to be a random collection of accidents that came to rest in the same place 12 miles from home. On March 2012, Hawks suggested that both he and the Pentagon had vested interest in dismissing the story as it was a resource-intensive and time-consuming distraction. He consulted a statistician who, although lacking conclusive evidence, believed it was Flight 19. Official records indicate that training accidents between 1942 and 1945 contributed to the loss of 95 aviation personnel from NAS Fort Lauderdale. In a 1992, another expedition located scattered debris on the ocean floor, though identification proved impossible. In the subsequent decade, search efforts expanded eastward into the Atlantic Ocean. Despite these endeavors, confirmation of the discovery of Flight 19 remains elusive. Then, in 2015, a newspaper report claimed that the Navy had retrieved a wrecked warplane with two bodies inside in the mid-1960s near Sebastian, Florida. Initially, they thought that this was from Flight 19, but this was later retracted by the Navy. And despite the Freedom of Information Act request for information in 2013, the identities of the bodies remain unknown due to the Navy lacking sufficient information for identification. In a separate incident, a wrecked plane discovered in Broward County's Everglades, which actually that's where I was born, not the Everglades, but Broward County, was incorrectly linked to Flight 19. This TBN-3E aircraft crashed on March 16, 1947. This crash was attributed to a pilot named Ralph N. Wacob developing vertigo, tragically resulting in his death. Which, I don't know if you've ever had vertigo before, but I could absolutely 100% say yes. I could see how that could crash a plane. In the history of aviation, the mysterious disappearance of the P-51 Mustang flight that was never found over the Bermuda Triangle will likely captivate the imagination and intrigue researchers and enthusiasts for quite some time. The Bermuda Triangle's reputation as a region prone to inexplicable disappearances and unexplained phenomena provides a backdrop for this specific tale. However, despite the allure of the unknown, a comprehensive exploration of like historical records, investigations that were conducted and expert analysis really offers no information as to what happened or what could have transpired. While the Bermuda Triangle's mystique might tempt us to think that this is a supernatural explanation, the more plausible narrative often lies within the realm of technical and human factors. The fact that Taylor would not commit to any one direction meant that he was essentially flying in circles trying to find where they could find land, and unfortunately those circles were not large enough, so he never saw it. The story of the missing P-51 Mustang flight over the Bermuda Triangle will serve as a reminder that the pursuit of knowledge and reason analysis can dispel myths and offer a deeper understanding of historical events and how humans operate. Kind of moving into the realm of the unknown, the lessons learned from such instances inform both aviation practices and our appreciation for the complex forces that shape our world. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed learning something about this, liking helps the video get out in the algorithm, and subscribing lets me know that you enjoy these maritime absolutely nightmare fuel videos. Something about going down over the ocean to me is much worse than going down over land. Maybe one day the P-51 Mustang group will be found, but considering how long ago that was, it is unlikely. I have a Patreon now, and I really appreciate the support that you guys are showing that over there. It's absolutely awesome. First, massive shout out to our literal Wendigo, Grayson West. Thanks, brother. Next, I'd like to thank our secondhand accounts, Kanan Johnson and Troy. And to the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well for your support. It is greatly appreciated. Absolute ballers. But all right, that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I'll see y'all in the next one.